about a week ago, John Sieben, whose final starts in about half an hour's time, <laughs> said to a TV interviewer, perhaps with a sense of witfulness, I don't know, perhaps with uh, um, his tongue in his cheek. He said, I trained for 10 years for a race that lasted two minutes and had it gone 30 seconds the other way, you would not even know that I existed. 10 years training, a race of two minutes and had it gone 30 seconds the other way, you would not even know that I exist. The world has its wisdom. How great is that wisdom? This, on this occasion, in terms of time. Not long ago, an airline, wishing to keep up with, uh, with others, purchased a plane. It was a special plane, an 18-seater. A high-powered jet, it cost $25 million. When the government agency and the government bureaucrats who were, who were responsible for the purchase of it looked into the issue more closely, they discovered that although they could pack the 18 people into it, they couldn't pack the luggage. And so they bought a second plane to carry the luggage, also at the price of 25 million. Both of those planes stand idle in Australia today, unused. The world has its wisdom how good is that wisdom? In a different area and at a different level, the Apostle Paul speaks about the world's wisdom and he speaks about true wisdom as well. And I want to address my attention to this and a number of the theological and pastoral problems faced by the Apostle in his first letter to the Corinthians. I want this morning then to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 6 and following. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths in spiritual words. The wisdom of this world. I've spoken about the wisdom of this world as far as time is concerned, about the spending of money. But Paul deals with issues that are even more far-reaching than that. In the preceding sections of 1 Corinthians, the apostle has used the word wisdom to describe the wisdom of the world. He's used it in two ways. He's used the term wisdom to refer to the skill, the way that one marshals human arguments employed in such a way so as to convince the hearer. The slick speaker, the person whose arguments appear at least to be powerful, that when one comes to examine them closely, one sees that in fact the basis on which those arguments are presented is wrong. Paul has used the word wisdom in a second negative way 
Not only does it have to do with a particular kind of arguing, but the word wisdom describes the type of thinking of the world. It has to do with human standards by which theological truth, ethical truth is evaluated. Those human standards by which the cross is judged to be foolishness, that wisdom which has or is the most profound error because it fails to understand the wisdom of God. I'll say more of that in a moment, but I want to ask two simple questions of this passage this morning and then draw the threads together by way of conclusion. The first is, God's wisdom, what is it like? In verses 6 and following, the Apostle speaks about the wisdom of God. He tells us something of its characteristics, both negative and positive, and I think it may help us to turn our attention to that. It might appear from the first part of the Apostle's argument that there is no such thing as wisdom at all that has anything to do with God. Paul's rejection of wisdom has been so complete almost, you might say, that one is almost surprised to discover that the Apostle speaks of a wisdom. Yes, there is a wisdom that he and his colleagues and potentially other Christians are able to impart. He tells us a number of things about this wisdom. First, that it's negative. He says that this wisdom of God, and we shall look at its content in a minute, but its wisdom does not belong to this age, God's wisdom that is. Paul indicates that unlike the wisdom of the world, which is marked by opposition to God, by rebellion against him, by a man-centeredness, the wisdom of this world is not, or the wisdom of God is not like that. It does not belong to this age, which in itself and like its rulers is passing away. He tells us furthermore, still negatively, that the wisdom of God is not similar to that of the rulers of this age. And here in particular, Paul has in mind those who were responsible for the crucifixion. But he is not only thinking of them. He is, in fact, including the wise ones to whom he has referred elsewhere. Those, for instance, to whom the Corinthians would especially give deference. Those who might be described as wise and powerful and of noble birth. It's not simply the rulers of this age who are responsible for the death of Jesus. It is any human or worldly leadership that is characterized by this same ungodly wisdom. And the wisdom of God is not like that. Therefore, I take it that the wisdom of God does not get received or is not akin to the thinking of the great ones of our society, the heavies, so-called, of our age, the ones who are significant, who are of noble birth, the ones who are important. God's wisdom stands in stark contrast to this other kind of wisdom which is characterized by this age and the leadership of this age. We ought not, therefore, to be caught out if we find that within our society, our leaders are doing things which we find to be um, sub-Christian or anti-Christian, we ought not, in a sense, to be caught out when so often those upon whom we may put our trust, however distant it may be, end up doing things that is contrary to the wisdom of God. Paul says a number of things on the positive side. I simply wish to focus on a couple of them, but not all. He says, we do speak a, a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that is God destined for our glory before time began. 
It's God's wisdom that has just been revealed in and through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. But the thing that I want to focus upon is that this wisdom is given to those whom Paul describes here. It's destined for our glory. God in his marvelous wise plan and in his gracious activity has overlooked the wise and the powerful and the noble. He has not made them to be the recipients of this wisdom. Paul says, by contrast, God has graciously bestowed it upon us. It is for our glory. And that means that those for whom God intends this wisdom will be participants in it. In fact, it can be said that we already are. Paul is telling the Corinthians that that is the case with them. They were converted men and women. You might think only just, but they were. And therefore they had received this wisdom of God. The apostle describes it in such a way to indicate that there are no spectators. The stands will be empty on the last day. Everyone will be actually out on the field. The track and field events will be participated by everyone who is there present. No scalpers getting $1,000 a hit for a ticket. No places in the stands whatever. Paul indicates that God has destined this for the glory of the Corinthians, himself and others, we may include ourselves. There will be no spectators, no reruns of gold medals and the like. Those who are involved in this wisdom will be in it and will be participants of it themselves. And just to reiterate the point, notice the kind of participants that there are. Not the beautiful people of the Coca-Cola and other ads. Not those who are the terrific weightlifters, the powerful and the mighty of the world. God has in fact chosen the weak and the ignoble and the humble to be the recipients of his marvellous wisdom. But I haven't as yet described what that wisdom is. I haven't defined it or told us what the content of it is. We get a clue to this when we look at verse 9. Paul draws in perhaps an amalgam of Old Testament passages rather than a single text from the Old Testament in order to underscore the truthfulness of what he has asserted. The Old Testament scriptures confirm what he has said. And he makes this statement. As it stands written in scripture, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. Now Paul does an amazing thing here. He t takes language used in the Old Testament to describe the age to come. The language refers to that which is marvellous, that's unfathomable, at least as far as man's unaided understanding is concerned. Paul uses the language of the life of heaven, and he uses it to describe this wisdom of God. Now if we ask ourselves, what is it that the apostle is describing? He is referring to the preaching of the cross, the preaching of Jesus Christ and him crucified, for he is the wisdom of God. That is true back in chapter uh, 1. So the marvellous thing is that the preaching of the cross of the Lord Jesus and him crucified is in fact at the very heart of what the Old Testament speaks of no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. The marvellous, almost inexpressible things focus upon the cross. The life of heaven 
language from the Old Testament depicting that is now riveted home to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is amazing. What then is the wisdom of God? It is the wisdom of God that focuses upon the Lord Jesus and in particular his death on the cross for us. Let us turn to our second question. How can we know this wisdom? If the marvellous and unfathomable things described in verse 9 are so incredible, how can we be let in then on the secret? If these are the issues of a crucified Messiah, what is the way by which we may come to know of this wisdom? In the section of verses 10 onwards to 13, the Apostle emphasises the means of the revelation, namely the Spirit of God himself. He makes it clear in this section that men and women on their own do not possess the quality that would make it possible to know God or to know his wisdom. Only God can know God. And his spirit becomes the link between him and us. In one sense, the spirit of God alone knows the things of God. And it is he that communicates to us that wisdom. Notice the progression that is mentioned in verses 12 and 13. There is the giving of the Spirit. That, as you understand, takes place at conversion. But the giving of the Spirit, according to verse 12, is for a particular purpose. In order, in order, in order that we may know or understand about those gracious things that God has given to us. In other words, so that we may appreciate and understand and enter into a deeper knowledge of these very things that focus on the, on the cross of Christ, God's Spirit is given to us. Now, of course, he is given to us for other purposes and reasons, some of which are even hinted at in this passage. But the particular point that comes out here is that God desires us to know and enter into more and more deeply his wisdom. He wants us to know more fully and to understand more clearly about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And verse 13 indicates something further. Not only are we given God's spirit, not only does the Spirit enable us to understand the life of heaven focused on the cross, verse 13 tells us that we're actually able to explain the truth of this to others. We're able to speak about spiritual things, those gracious things given to us by God, by means of the right language, the very words that can make it intelligible to other people. In other words, God's Spirit gives us the language appropriate to the message, a language that is not bound up with human wisdom, but a language by which we may be able to talk about it, share in it with others. Now, I take it that involves simply, brothers and sisters, that we are able to speak with others, friends. We're able to talk with fellow Christians. We're able to share in the things of what God has done for us in and through the cross. And at the same time, we are able to speak about it to those who are outside, the sort of men and women who may at this point of time be natural people who do not have the spirit. Now the Corinthians had actually gone through all of this. But as Christians, they were still wrong-headed in their thinking. They allowed the issues of the world and worldly wisdom to impinge upon them. They were behaving as unbelievers. They were pursuing the wrong kind of wisdom. And Paul wants to bring them back to the wisdom that is there in the very gospel. What will be said of you at the conclusion of your training here at college? What kind of wisdom will you finish with? There are all sorts of wisdom that one can have. 
those of us who are responsible for writing part of the SPIC report will know some of the things that could be mentioned. You may have certain skills, you may have certain facilities, you may have abilities in various directions, but they may bear not one whit on the wisdom of God that I've been speaking about. Will your preaching and your life be cross-centred? Cross Will it be spirit-endowed? Will it be Christ-glorifying? As you leave the college at the end of this year, perhaps for the last time, or you may return next year for, for a further part of your course, how much will you know about this wisdom? And even if you say, yes, I know that in theory, will you be like the Corinthians? Will I be like the Corinthians? Always in danger of sliding back and chasing the wisdom of the world. The world has its wisdom. John Sieben's wistful interview may have been more right than he thought. Ten years for two minutes, and if it went 30 seconds the other way, he would be a non-entity. What are we after? The wisdom of God focused on the cross or the wisdom of this world? Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have demonstrated your wise master plan. We thank you that it is in the cross that you save men and women. We thank you for the gift of the Spirit, the ability to understand this wisdom, and the privilege of sharing it with others. And we pray that our lives may focus upon your wisdom this day and throughout, throughout the rest of our ministries. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Every state... <laughs>our heads for prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this privilege of being together in your name this morning. We thank you for the presence of the Lord Jesus in our midst, and we pray that he may exercise his rule and lordship over our lives through his word today. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. In a society that is increasingly secular, it is inevitable that there will be all kinds of reactions to that secularism. Not only in the Christian church, but elsewhere. There are movements within our society that run counter to the dominant or prevailing moods of secularism. This is not only so here in the West, but in other parts as well. In a sense, it's not, to be, it's not uh, surprising that there is a move towards spirituality. One finds now institutions, even fairly secular ones, offering courses on the subject of spirituality. And one is surprised to discover these in handbooks of such institutions when a year or two ago you'd have thought it was not possible. It not only occurs in the West, as I've said, but in other parts as well. India, for example, has always been a religious country. But it's, in, it's interesting to learn that parts of India, like, for example, the city of Delhi, has given in, in some respects, to Western influence and shows itself to be increasingly secular. 
But there, are, there is always the spiritually minded person who's not unwilling to make a buck or two out of being that. I think, for example, of a number of uh, uh, sadhus that I've come across, I think especially of an occasion when in the city of Allahabad in northern India, at the time of a special festival or mela, coming across a number of so-called holy or spiritual men. You will, I'm sure, have taken note at the ways in which holiness and spirituality is referred to, as I say, in all sorts of strange contexts. The Apostle Paul tells us something of who is the spiritually minded person, the pneumaticos. And in the passage that I wanted to look at this morning, he in fact describes a number of different people, each of which we shall look at in turn. I'm going to read from the NIV, but I'm going to change the translation at a number of points for reasons that will become evident. Starting at 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 14. The, da the natural man does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The spiritual man makes judgment about, judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may, may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as earthy, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly, for since there is jealousy and quarrelling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Before we look at the spiritual man, let's ask a question or two about the natural man. Translated or referred to here in the NIV translation of the man who is without the spirit. The natural man spoken of here uh, by Paul in his letter to the Corinthians is a person who is best defined negatively. His natural and intellectual resources may or may not be advanced. He may be quite gifted in life. He may have even attained a position. He is perhaps not, in the ordinary sense, a bad man, one who is foolish or irreligious. These factors are immaterial, though we, of course, place great weight on them. They do not enter into the apostles' reckoning about the natural man. And he is described negatively in three ways. He is referred to in terms of his relationship to, or the lack of relationship that he has, to the Spirit. First, he does not welcome the things of the Spirit. And as we saw last week, the things of the Spirit, or the things which the Spirit reveals to us, are particularly those things, the message, centered on the cross of the Lord Jesus. His death as a substitute for the forgiveness of our sins. Those in particular are the things of the spirit which the natural man does not welcome. He does not receive them gladly as a guest, for that's what the word implies here in this context, and therefore it means that he rejects them. He says a very firm no to them. And while these very things are the issues bound up with the life of heaven itself, the natural man does not welcome them. He says, no, thank you very much to the things of the Spirit. The message centered on the cross of the Lord Jesus. The apostle then goes on to tell us why it is that the natural man rejects the things of the Spirit and in so doing tells us a second negative feature about this person, this character. They are foolishness to him. This particular man refuses them because they're madness. 
That is, they reverse the values by which he lives. People are revealed for who they are by the way they respond to the cross. And for the natural man, he sees this as foolishness. And thus, he stands over against God in his ways. He is therefore a man or a woman who is under judgment. So the natural person doesn't welcome the things of the spirit. They are foolishness to him. Even though he may give the appearance of being spiritually minded in other ways. I can think of the occasion when I've spoken with, with individuals in a private way, both here in India and back here in Australia. Folk who apparently were spiritual, and yet when the opportunity was given to speak about the things of the spirit in a couple of sad instances that I recall, those people said, no thanks, that's not for me. Paul goes on to say here that the natural man cannot understand these things because they are spiritually discerned. This person is the worldly wise man or woman, the person whose life is bounded by this existence whose mind is encased in this world. He or she is earthbound, taken up with the things of the world. One may say that this person's thoughts never get off the ground. The things of the spirit, particularly the message of the cross, are spiritually discerned. And this particular person does not have the equipment by which to assess or to make appropriate judgments about these things. He cannot understand them. Paul says literally he cannot get to know them because he lacks the prerequisite, namely the Spirit of God himself. And so when this man or woman makes judgments about what God is doing in the world, if indeed that thought crosses um, his mind, then he is unable to discern the issues now, brothers and sisters, we're not talking here about intellectual ability. We're talking about a process of spiritual examination, of discernment. This presupposes the spirit which the natural person lacks. I would venture to suggest that within our churches there are lots of people, nice people, who fall into this very category. The issues of Christ's death the things of the Spirit are an embarrassment to them. And may I suggest to you that in the days that follow in your ministry, you will be tempted to shift away from the very centre, bound up with the things of the Spirit, the centre regarding Christ's death, you will be tempted to shift away from that at the centre of your preaching and ministry. John Chapman was telling me some time ago how it is very easy to be tempted to do something different. I'm not referring to the kind of situation of which it is said, ten thousands are his texts and all his sermons won. I'm not referring to that. I'm thinking about the temptation and the pressure to shift ever so slightly away from the center. You will be under pressure from lots of nice church people to whom you minister and with whom you get on well, you will be tempted to shift away from those things. But those ideas will be prompted by natural men and women who do not welcome the things of the spirit. What then about the spiritual person? What does Paul say here? What does the word of God speak to us or tell us about the marks of the Pneumaticos, the spiritual person. Well, I suppose to state the obvious, in verse 12, the apostle tells us that this person has received the spirit. The spiritual person is the one with the spirit. Again, there is no comment on this person's natural abilities, the person's personality, the intellectual abilities, 
and the like. It did not matter to the apostle whether this man or woman's IQ was high or low. Ultimately, these sorts of things are irrelevant. The spiritual person is, by definition, one who possesses the spirit and is a Christian. And therefore, because this person has the wherewithal, he or she then can then make judgments about all things. Verse 15. The spiritual person makes judgment about all things because he himself is not subject to anyone's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ? Surely that is saying too much, is it not? Well, these verses, these words, have often been wrestled from their context. The text which speaks about the spiritual person making judgments about all things has been used in church history to great detriment. The text, when taken out of its uh, setting here, has been made to prove all sorts of things. Supposed God-given capacities regarding insights, judgments, evaluations and the like. But let us put it in its context, in its framework. We have already been told that the Spirit of God is the one who searches all things, even the depths of God. And therefore what the text is telling us is that the person who has the Spirit can discern God's ways. Not necessarily all things, I don't think it's saying that. But in particular, can discern God's ways as far as his work of salvation. And it has to do with those things that were formerly hidden in God, but now revealed through the Spirit. When, therefore, God's word tells us that the spiritual person can make judgments about all things, it is another way of saying that that person is able to discern God's ways, what God is doing in the world. But the person lacking the Spirit of God cannot discern what God is doing. The one who has the Spirit obviously can because of the presence of the Spirit. But the one without the Spirit cannot examine or make judgments on the person with the Spirit. Well, if the first phrase has been misunderstood in Christian circles, there is no doubt that the second one has. Again, it too has suffered much in the history of the church. There are those who consider themselves to be so full of the Spirit that they are beyond discipline or the counsel of others. They take the text that the, spiritual, the, um, the person without the Spirit cannot examine or make judgments on the person with the Spirit. And therefore there are Christian men and women who have taken that to mean that they cannot be criticized, they cannot be spoken to, they cannot be disciplined by anyone who lacks the Spirit. And you can see how the argument goes to the next point. If someone who does claim to be a Christian then begins to uh, judge or evaluate or discern this individual who's full of the Spirit, so-called, then the man or the woman who's so full of the Spirit then turns around to his friend who begins to chide him and says, well, you obviously cannot have the Spirit if you do that sort of thing. It is interesting to go back over the past hundred years and to note the movements that there have been in the Christian church, special revelations of the Spirit, deeper life movement, uh, folk who say that you must believe in the absolute extreme if you're going to get certain mighty things done, there have been examples of people from each one of those movements who have used this text as a buffer against criticism. It's quite incredible. But the words here of Paul about the natural person not being able to stand in judgment on the spiritually minded person that those words have been used by those, by people in each one of those movements. 
But what is the apostle saying? The apostle is in fact saying that the person who does not have the spirit cannot understand God's ways, his wisdom, his purposes of salvation for the world. And therefore, when the Christian man or woman seeks to act in a godly way, the non-Christian, the man without the spirit, is not able to evaluate or make proper judgments because that person does not understand what God is doing in the world and therefore the place that the Christian has within those purposes. Virtually every form of spiritual elitism in the last hundred years at least has appealed to this text. Let us therefore beware. But let us on the other hand give to this passage its true import its true weight. The one with the Spirit of God knows what God is doing because he knows the work of salvation that has been achieved. He understands the things that were formerly hidden but now have been revealed, issues of the life of heaven. But the passage that I read did not stop, or at least I didn't stop reading it anyway, chapter 2 verse 16. I went on for a particular purpose to read the first four verses of chapter 3. There were those at Corinth who might well have said to the Apostle Paul, Okay, Paul, I have the spirit. I must be a spiritual person in the way that you have spoken about this. I am not a natural man. I have received the gospel. I know what it is to talk about the work of the spirit. I must then be the spiritual person. The apostle then, in answer to that, trains his guns on the Corinthians and pronounces that they are not spiritual at all. Not in the sense that they are unconverted, he has already indicated that, but they are fleshly. They are still thinking like mere human beings, like those who do not have the spirit. Paul is not denying their conversion, that they are Christian people. He has already given thanks for the fact that the testimony to Christ has been confirmed in their midst. But that is part of the problem. The Corinthians were thinking and behaving like natural men and women. And so in these four verses, the apostle then recounts what happened at the time when he first went preaching the gospel to them and what has continued up to this present day. He tells us about his first preaching in Corinth when he came speaking the word of God. <coughs> These members of the city of Corinth became Christians and that indeed was a marvelous miracle. That there should have been a church in Corinth at all is incredible given our knowledge of what Corinth was like in the ancient world. That a congregation should have been called out, that God should have chosen the foolish things of the world and brought them to a knowledge of himself, that in itself was a marvellous miracle. When they were newly converted, they were babes in Christ. They were, as one translation puts it, made of flesh. That is, they were human, they were frail, they were weak. They were very young Christians. And Paul rightly fed them with milk rather than solid food. They needed to progress in understanding. They needed to move from the elementary grasp of the gospel to a more mature knowledge. And so the apostle gave them food appropriate to their needs. As, for example, a mother would give to a newborn child not solid food, but milk. So far, so good. Nothing is amiss. The solid things of the word, the food, the solid food, could not be given to them at this stage. But the rub comes later on. When Paul says, I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it, there is no word of criticism. But the punchline comes in the following words. 
Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Some time later, when Paul writes this letter, they are still not able to receive solid food. The baby hasn't grown. The solid things of the Christian life, they were not able to receive. And this must have been a bitter statement when the Corinthians received it. Given their particular gifts, their wisdom and knowledge. In fact, from what we can tell, of the congregations in the first century church, given the limited evidence that we have, the Corinthians had the most spectacular gifts. Prophecy, speaking in tongues, a whole range of abilities and gifts. And they clearly prized these. Even the apostle acknowledges that they have gifts of speech and wisdom of every kind. They have the ability to discern the Christian faith. They, can, they also have the gift of the gab so that they can put it in a way that is clear and simple and intelligible. Of all the congregations that we know about, the Corinthians were way ahead of their contemporaries. And yet the crazy thing is that for all their gifts and abilities, they are immature as a whole congregation. They are worldly. They have spectacular gifts. Perhaps the spectacular gifts got in the road. They are worldly. They have the spirit, yes, but they are behaving like men and women who do not. Now, I actually think that we fall into the same kind of trap. We actually believe that a person is mature when they are particularly gifted. And we think that if someone doesn't have a wide range of spiritual gifts, they are immature. There is for us usually a correlation between the two. It works out in a number of different ways in our pastoral contexts. We fuss over the people in the parish who have spectacular abilities. We pass by the little old ladies or others who may be mature, but because their gifts are not external or not seen by us, we often just gloss over them. We fuss about people who have spectacular gifts, the kind of gifts that we think are attractive. And so often we make the correlation and we say such and such a person is mature. At the other end of the spectrum, as I've said, there may be a person who is quieter or who is, uh, has uh, abilities that are far more um, uh, or far less spectacular and so on. And we think that such a person is not mature. They're not an upfront person. We fall into the same trap the Corinthians did. We link the two. And putting it bluntly, we bomb out both ways. We bomb out both ways. And so here in the college, we do the same sort of thing when we think in terms of examinations and marks. We spend an inordinate amount of time on essays because the fear of man causes a snare and at times the getting of a certain grade is more important than other issues. It is possible for quiet times and prayer to get ditched in this sort of pursuit. Now my brothers and sisters, I speak as one who is tempted and who has fallen in the same sorts of areas. Paul says you're worldly. We use expressions like the great ones. We talk about people being heavies. We use language that is like that. Paul particularly pins down the evidence of their worldliness their confusion in terms of the strife and squabbles. They're living like men, that nothing more. An egocentric living, no doubt, as Barrett puts it, accentuated by their gifts. 
so that the very blessings which they had received from God were misused. I believe as a college, as a whole, we need to be careful here. I think there are times when we have a reputation for being sharp theologically, and yet not so often is it said that we evidently walk in love. What is the thing that people remember about Moore College and Deaconess House? How often is it this second factor rather than the first? Three kinds of people spoken about. The natural man, the man who doesn't welcome the things of the spirit, the spiritual person who has uh, been privileged by receiving God's spirit and understanding the work of Christ and yet it is still possible that men and women who have the spirit are able to behave like carnal or worldly Christians. And I believe that it is just so easy for us to be confused over these issues. Confusing maturity with gifts and falling into the very dangers that the Corinthians did. What kind of persons are abroad in our society today? In the midst of an increasingly secular society, there are those who would pass for spiritual men and women. Let us make sure that we are truly godly in the way that the Bible marks it out. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we confess to you today that, that too often we think in worldly ways, we behave like mere men, that and nothing else. And we seek your forgiveness and mercy. We pray that we may indeed walk in ways that truly please you. We ask that we may be concerned about love and the gifts of the spirit, the fruit of the spirit rather, that will be for the upbuilding and edification of others. And we ask that having heard your word this morning, that we may avoid the pitfalls and simply live in a manner that pleases the Lord Jesus. And we ask it in his name. Amen.